Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to this special live stream. I am honored to be with Roshan Abbas from Campaign for Uyghurs. She is a activist. She is a journalist. She used to work for Radio Free Asia. She has been active in the field of Uyghur activism for a number of decades. In fact, the earliest I could find that she'd actually started off a a protest uh, was around the time of December the 12th, 1985. So we, we're talking about a very long time ago and someone with extensive experience in this field. And uh, I'd like you all to warmly welcome Sister Roshana Bas. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you so much for having me and giving me the opportunity to uh, speak today. Brilliant. So Sister, let's begin off with some, I think, really hard truths, I think. Um, most of the people on this audience, they're already aware of the genocide that's taking place, the arrest, the torture, the detention, the separation of children and their families, organ harvesting, forced labor, sterilization, abortion, you name it, this genocidal regime that we are facing currently is the most brutal oppression of Muslims since brutal oppression of any ethnic group since perhaps World War II and what happened in the Holocaust. So um, firstly, I'd like to begin off with, uh, you're not just an activist who is away from this conflict. You have faced dire consequences directly yourself as well. So I'd like you to just um, speak briefly about the the way that the Chinese Communist Party attacks the family of the people who stand up. To the persecution? Yes, um, unfortunately, you know, uh, what you said is very true. Chinese uh, regime, uh, Chinese Communist Party is not only uh, conducting a genocide and the uh, uh, basically uh, uh, right now what's happening in our country is uh, meeting not one, but all five elements of the uh, Geneva Conventions, um, uh, the crimes, description of the crimes of genocide. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, the, the world community is muted. Uh, we are not seeing a lot of uh, actions, especially from our Muslim brothers and sisters in from the Muslim majority countries. It's uh, due to Chinese government's disinformation and the uh, false narratives. Um, basically, half of the world community is becoming victims for uh, Chinese regime's uh, false propagandas. Um, mm -hmm. Myself is a, a victim uh, for a Chinese regime's retaliation, as what we are seeing a lot in the news today, how China is uh, Chinese Communist Party is retaliating against many uh, countries and the lawmakers and you know, human rights uh, activists and groups. I have been outspoken about the uh, um, situation. Um, I went on the public for the uh, first time, actually, after this current genocide started. Um, we actually, we have to go back a little bit, you know, like. Uh, past more than 70 years, the Chinese government has been conducting uh, discrimination, oppression, and the systematic uh, uh, assimilation of the Uyghur people. But uh, starting from 2014, they have established concentration camps and the uh, uh, taking innocent uh, people. And beginning of the 2017, uh, we started to hear massive, uh, the Uyghur people were taken to concentration camps. And then in uh, September 2018, I was on the panel at one of the think tanks here in Washington, D.C., talking about the conditions of those concentration camps and the uh, Chinese government's genocidal policies and the uh, crimes. Uh, while I was outlining the fate of my uh, husband's uh, entire family, which was uh, taken, you know, the whole family disappeared to the concentration camps. Six days after, Chinese regime 
abducted my sister and my aunt, both of them on the same day from two different cities as a retaliation for my activism here in America as an American citizen. Uh, yet, you know, my sister uh, became the victim. For me, uh, speaking out, exercising my freedom of uh, speech and freedom of expression caused my own sister's freedom in China. Also, she's a uh, very um, quiet and uh, not a politically active at all uh, person uh, who's just uh, living a simple altruistic life. And uh, she's a retired medical doctor. She doesn't need any kind of training or, uh, uh, you know, vocational uh, training or re-education. But uh, yeah, she's still there in some dark dungeon. Yeah, and it's a really really sad story because uh you know um dr gulshan abbas is somebody who i've heard you in previous lectures say was not involved in any sort of activism or anything like this she was a retired medical doctor she doesn't need vocational training right mm -hmm. i mean that's just obvious and from from the last interview i heard of yours you you publicly stated that she you, you have no evidence that she's even alive yeah, um, for, you know, since September 2018, it's uh, more than two and a half years, we have not gotten any information on her whereabouts or we have not seen any proof of life videos or picture or nothing, you know. Um, the only thing we heard was uh, last December, uh, about uh, three, four months ago, end of December, and that she was harshly uh, uh, sentenced on the false in you know, bogey charges. And uh, the timing of this, like you mentioned, was right after you gave that talk, I believe the panel uh, talk with other scholars at the Hudson Institute is I think six days after that. Correct, yes. Yeah, so for all these years, I mean, you've been in the States um, from my research, um, I believe since 19, 89 um uh or, or, or perhaps earlier um and you've been i believe uh you know uh, your family's sort of uh, been obviously affected by it but the timing is, is is you know um something which which gives it away i also wanted to uh, just highlight to the viewers that you know we have a petition um i'm going to put that in the comment section please share this petition and all the students watching around the world please share this story because it's not just numbers. It's not just millions of people in concentration camps. These are real life stories. Um, so Sister Roshan, another thing I wanted to highlight, and I think it's very important to get to this. Uh, there's a lot of obviously um, uh, news and information that's coming out there, a lot of propaganda, a lot of counter propaganda, but there's some certain things that you've said that I really agree with and I want you to sort of um, uh, expand upon them. Uh, you've previously stated that this is not just a a, a issue to do with, um, you know, China taking on extremism or terrorism. This is rather about Uyghur identity. And in fact, from a broader perspective, it's, in your words, a war upon Islam itself, right? Now, I actually totally agree with that, but some people will say it's just, you know, maybe China's just a bit overzealous because they have a bit of a problem with extremism. So could you just speak about that briefly, please? Like my sister, there are hundreds and the thousands of people taken to concentration camps. They are well-educated uh, elites and intellectuals of the community, the thought leaders. They are not extremists. Um, and we have um, basically, you know, the Chinese regime actually had uh, some sort of document released. There are 48 um, reasons anybody could take into the concentration camps. And there is a 403 pages of the first sets of the three uh, leaked documents states that um, uh, what kind of people are being targeted has nothing to do with extremism or radicalized Muslims. Um, as simple as salam alaikum, which is the most peaceful way of greeting each other, 
And uh, as simple as praying, uh, even just at home, or fasting during Ramadan, or not uh, eating pork or drinking alcohol can cause people to end up in the concentration camps. Or anybody who ever traveled to any uh, one of the Muslim majority countries, such as Turkey, if we have a, a people studying in Turkey or Egypt or any other countries, if their parents ever went to visit their children in those one in one of these countries, they were taken. Look at in uh, Istanbul and Ankara right now, hundreds of uh, Uyghur youth are on the streets carrying their family members' pictures and saying, where's my family? None of these people taken to the camps are extremists or uh, radicalized Muslims. When the Chinese regime claims to have um, fighting against the extremism and the calling uh, those Uyghurs are engaged in the illegal Islamic activists, uh, illegal Islamic uh, uh, acts. They are talking about every single ordinary practice of Islam. So basically, the Chinese regime is waging war on Islam and waging war on Uyghurs' ethnic identity, uh, ethnicity, because this. Uh, uh, ambassador Cui Tian Kai, the uh, Chinese ambassador to United States, sits only uh, 25 miles from here. He actually gave a uh, an interview on CNN, and he, you know, unbelievably, he told CNN. You can Google that. You can find that the Chinese ambassador's uh, interview on CNN in the uh, early 2019. He said, "With those." so-called re-education camps, we are in a quote unquote, he said, we are changing those Uyghur people to normal persons. Yeah. We, are, we are making them normal persons. Imagine that our identity, our culture, our language, and the, our religion, everything that makes Uyghur people unique made us, um, abnormal commodity at the front of the Chinese regime. So basically, with this genocide, the Chinese regime is killing four birds with one stone. Yeah. When you look at it, you know, one is forcing the millions of Uyghurs into slavery in the concentration camps and in the prisons and sending them to forced labor facilities, advancing the PRC's, uh, the CCP's economy. Two, dislocating Uyghurs from their homes and the neighborhoods and the towns and the counties to make room for the Belt and Road Initiative, vacating the land for Belt and Road Initiative, and also make room for Han Chinese settlers and the, uh, giving them uh, you know, preferential treatments and housing and the jobs. Three, by jailing the most of the Uyghur men in the camps and the prisons, and sending them to uh, forced labor facilities. Now they are forcing unwed and abandoned Uyghur girls and Uyghur women into uh, marrying Han Chinese. And they cannot refuse such a forced marriage because if they say no, then they will be labeled as Islamic extremists who didn't want to marry non-Muslim Han Chinese. So what is that, brother? think about it you know your muslim sister is forced to marry a person she doesn't want to marry because she doesn't love or she doesn't know the man yeah. but she's afraid of rejecting such a marriage if she says no then she will be sent to the camps so that you know i call it government sponsored mass rape of the uyghur women in the name of the uh, so called sham marriages and yeah. for by those, uh, you know, concentration camps, the CCP is orchestrating organ farms, basically, where millions of Uyghurs are forced to uh, undergo DNA sampling, DNA tests, and the medical tests, and they were prepped for slaughter for Uyghur. I mean, for the uh, organ harvesting. 
Yes, and you can see footage online of actually our Uyghur sisters being forced to marry. You can see some of them visibly upset. I actually saw a video where there was a woman screaming and she was actually in a wedding gown and being forced and taken away. So we're literally talking about historically, if there was an equivalent, we're talking about how the Muslims uh, were basically destroyed and uprooted from Spain, from Andalusia. Um, you know, I often say, speak up for the Uyghurs before there's no Uyghurs to speak of. We're literally talking about the end of Islam there. Now, I just want to remind the viewers that, you know, Islam entered uh, East Turkestan, Chinese occupied East Turkestan, a very long time ago. We're not talking about, you know, there, there is no such thing as why are they, um, you know, Turkish Muslims, or Turkic Muslims in China? The question is, why are there Chinese people in uh, East Turkestan? Uh, Sultan Satuk Burga Khan actually accepted Islam in 954. So we're talking about the 10th century. But you've said, and I want everybody to understand this, you've said um, East Turkestan is Islam's eastern fortress. And if it falls, then you will have implications for the entire Muslim world. Uh, can you just elaborate on that, please? Yes, our homeland is Turkestan. Just look at the name itself, you know, East Turkestan. It's the east side of the, all the, uh, the, the okay, let, let me go back a little bit here. When you look at this Central Asia, uh, there's Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, all these uh, former uh, uh, Russian uh, republics now all uh, became independent countries. They're all Islamic countries, you know, Muslim countries, the, the Muslim uh, people live there. And also there's Turkey, and then there's, you know, Middle East and Africa, all the Muslim uh, majority countries to the to the uh, the West. Um, so when you look at Malaysia and Indonesia, the other Muslim countries on the eastern part of China, um, the most of the like uh, more than, you know, like 60, 70 percent of the uh, Muslim uh, community are basically going from where we are, we are in the northwest corner of China, and the uh, that's why uh, the name is Turkestan has a historical, symbolic, and the uh, 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 symbolic, historical, and the you know geographical uh, meaning to it. Xinjiang, the name given to us by the uh, Chinese regime after the occupation of the Manchus means new territory, Xin means new in Chinese, Jiang means border or territory. So what's keeping the uh, Chinese regime in where they are is because of that massive land yeah. in the northwest corner. It's about one sixth of entire China. And we are the largest Muslim community um, in in Central Asia, when you look at it, you know, uh, Chinese regime says 12 million population, but the Uyghur census, according to Uyghur consensus, it's more than 20 million. Yeah. So we are the the Muslims on the East, largest Muslim community in the East. Once you basically, you know, they, what the Chinese regime is doing is because of our homeland is in the heart of Central Asia, and it's a gateway to all these stands, you know, in the Central Asia, the Muslim countries, and the, it's a gateway to Turkey, to Middle East, and all the way to Africa. We are the one, actually, our Islamic and our, you know, like our Islamic uh, history and our Muslim identity is what was keeping us from getting assimilated to the uh, Chinese uh, Han population, as all these years the Chinese regime tried to do. If they push down this fortress, there's nothing is going to stop China going all the way, like uh, what they are doing in Pakistan, and they, they are going into Central Asia, basically uh, running uh, however they want in Kazakhstan and in Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan and the other countries. So if they don't watch it, they all will become the next East Turkestan. 
the yes. Uyghurs today will become the future of the entire Muslim majority countries because the Chinese communist regime being an atheist government, any kind of original thought or faith or religion, any worship to Allah or any kind of religion is a threat. So although they are trying to show and they try to uh, cover their crimes against the Islam by building the second, uh, building the uh, largest actually, uh, largest mosque uh, in uh, Nigeria, and that they are uh, organizing the uh, uh, largest conference in Malaysia, calling it uh, Islam in China, and they're trying to show off uh, all kinds of propaganda videos about the Muslim Sara uh, uh, being able to practice their faith uh, without any trouble, but in reality, they are wiping out the religion. Yeah. So, to speak out for the Uyghur people, defending the Uyghur Muslims is not just about the future of the Uyghurs. This is about defending Islam. It's mm -hmm. about fighting for Islam. So the cause of the Uyghurs should be taken as cause of Islam. That's how the Muslim brothers and sisters should uh, see and they should act. Because okay. it's not just about their Muslim uh, Uyghur brothers and sisters are getting wiped out. It's the Islam religion is getting wiped out. Absolutely, absolutely. And, uh, you know, one of the other things which everybody needs to uh, keep in mind is 10% of the people in the camps are actually Kazakhs. So it's not to do with, you know, it's clearly to do with Islam. Uh, in my interviews with uh, the Uyghurs who've come out of the camps, they have all identified that Islam is the uh, thing they're trying to eradicate. They're taught atheism, they're taught the tenets of communism, they're taught to be grateful to the Chinese communist state. So everything that you're saying is actually um, something that's verified by the testimonies of the people that come out of the camps. Now, um, the other thing I wanted to briefly mention before we get to Campaign for Uyghurs, which is your organization and how people can get involved, we can cover that near the end. Um, what I want to speak about is that um, you know, you've been very vocal on this issue. I've seen you have debates with this, um, uh, you know, your recent debate with this man called Daniel Drumbrell, or something like this he's called. Uh, and it was really appalling to see that, you know, we have sometimes Westerners who are defending Chinese crimes. And I think the most shocking part of the debate, which I saw, was not only his lack of manners uh, and, and his poor arguments, was actually that when you raised the issue of your sister, Dr. Gulshan, he tried to say, it's your fault. It's, it's basically, don't you think it's your fault because you work for uh, this or that? And, you know, it's ridiculous. We have these things. And also one of the arguments that people like him, which are basically Chinese trolls, right? What they churn out is, well, China's only putting Muslims in constant vocational camps, but America did this and America did that. But I just want to highlight something for the viewers and I want your thoughts on this. All of those wars that took place in the Middle East for the last 20 years, the intention was not Islam. It was other things. And Westerners stood up and Western MPs stood up and that episode is over now. So just to bring that up and say, okay, since that happened, let us have a genocide. That argument doesn't work. Can you just briefly mention uh, about this? The beauty of the Western countries, people can criticize and they talk about any kind of injustice if that was happening. So those countries can improve. And United States too. I'm not saying the United States government is perfect. There are mistakes in the history and also, uh, uh, you know, currently there are some issues and that's why people can talk about it, people can protest, people can criticize. So this government can improve and be the, the country and the government for the people. But the, uh, the person whom you mentioned purposely trying to dehumanize me by kept, you know, if you look at his tweets currently, even uh, he's uh, calling me that I support the terrorists in Guantanamo Bay and I worked for CIA and I did this and I did that. And because I was in Guantanamo, I have no right to say anything. 
and because of uh, everything that I had done, uh, it's my fault that my sister is taken. Yeah, disgusting. I, you know, disgusting. Exactly. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to cut your sister, Roshan. I couldn't watch that in interview and not get angry because you were saying I have family in camps, and he's basically saying, you know. Um, you know, you know, they have a security issue. And you gave him a really good argument. You said, well, there's this issue of Han Chinese men going around uh, stabbing children. Should we lock up all the Chinese men? And he had no answer. And likewise, he was trying to, I mean, uh, just a quick point. If the Chinese Communist Party has, has committed the great uh, leap forward with millions of people dying, the cultural genocide, which uh, was around the time that you were a, a child, and the Tiananmen Square massacre, the Barron uh, massacre, all these massacres, a genocide is a walk in the park for them compared to this. Yet he was denying the genocide and he was attacking you verbally. I just yeah. found this unbelievable. I am not surprised because um, he's sitting in China and using the platforms that's not uh, uh, available for the regular ordinary Chinese citizens. There's yeah. 1.4 billion Han Chinese people other than the Chinese trolls and the... Uh, other than the uh, Chinese uh, government officials, nobody can use Twitters or Facebooks or YouTubes. And he's in Shenzhen, he's in China, and he has a, a very uh, successful business there that's being uh, basically supported by the uh, CCP and being, uh, you know, uh, like reported uh, and the uh, supported. Uh, by yeah. the uh, Chinese state-owned media and the, uh, by the Chinese uh, government. So, of course, he's going to say uh, what the Chinese regime is saying. All the accusations he's saying against me are the accusations also uh, being said openly, publicly, by the uh, Chinese Foreign Ministry's uh, spokesperson, Zhao Lijuan. He tweeted, actually, calling me all this uh, uh, false... Uh, accusations what the Daniel Dombrell was saying. So of course, you know, and for anybody and everyone know for you to have a successful business in China, uh, you have to comply with uh, everything the Chinese government is saying. And the, uh, more than that, he became a propagandist, not just the genocide denials, but uh, he is basically uh, being uh, Chinese communist regime's mouthpiece. Look yeah. at it, you know, Chinese government is trying to control the entire world and trying to silence the United Nations. And they have silenced the World Health Organizations. They have silenced the Hollywood. They have silenced the NBA. Yeah. So of course, uh, you know, Chinese government can make Daniel Dombriel say whatever they want to say about me and while they are trying to silence me, but it's yeah. not going to work, you know. When yeah. the, each time Daniel Dombrell comes out and the uh, tweets or uh, uh, calls my name and they uh, try to, uh, you know, spread those uh, false accusations and the uh, disinformation against me, I feel that uh, good, you know, my work is being impactful and the, uh, I guess uh, the, it's hitting the target. So that absolutely. gives me confidence that I am in the right track. Yeah, absolutely. And also, I just wanted the viewers uh, to realize something that uh, I was amazed by your patience in that debate. But also, after the debate, and recently he's been on state TV, and they introduce him uh, like a political commentator. But according to my research, he is no political commentator. In fact, he was a nobody, an absolute nobody, until he moved to China. Mm -hmm. And now he has hundreds of, uh, according to him himself, hundreds of millions of people have seen his video, which I find very hard to believe. And additionally, on top of that, as a person who has no credentials whatsoever ending up on state TV gives you uh, an idea of why he's there. And the reason why he's there is because he's not Chinese. If he was Chinese, he would be selling noodles right now. He would have no credibility. But because he's a Westerner and he's a sellout, he's just given all this platform and love um, and actually, he, his video was played by the foreign uh, somebody from the foreign ministry. But anyway, enough about that troll. Um, Campaign for Uyghurs is your organization, and there's been some really great work that you've been putting out. I'm just going to share for everybody um, so that you know you guys can get involved. 
and support the great work that you guys do. So could you just briefly mention about this organization and what the AIMS objectives are and what you guys do? Yeah, thank you for your uh, comments about our organization. In the uh, very short period of time since the establishment of the campaign for Uyghurs, uh, I think uh, we are uh, doing a pretty a good job, you know, uh, uh, to fighting against this enormous monstrous barbaric uh, communist regime. So we established campaign for Uyghurs in the fall of uh, 2017 in order to advocate for the uh, human rights and the democratic freedoms of the, the Uyghurs, Kazakhs, and the other uh, Turkic uh, Muslim. Uh, uh, ethnicities after the uh, sharp uh, deterioration of the uh, conditions in East Turkestan, especially after encountering with the uh, uh, muted world. If you remember back in uh, 2017, when we were crying out loud about the detentions and more than a million people back then, you know, um, we were saying that the uh, innocent people are getting detained and the China is basically outlining every aspect of Islam but the entire international community was muted, including the United States, actually. It took us a while to even um, tell the uh, lawmakers and the politicians and the, the government here to pay attention. So while facing this unprecedented mass incarceration of an ethnicity after the uh, World War II, when uh, more than a million Uyghurs were taken to the concentration camps, uh, the realities of the uh, the horrific, um, you know, when when you look at it, uh, even back then, the uh, conditions of the uh, the all uh, the elements of the genocide was occurring. So um, we decided to establish the organization, and the uh, since uh, September uh, two thousand nineteen, one year anniversary date of my innocent sister's abduction. I quit my full-time job and the, uh, I became an activist, full-time activist and advocate. Um, you know, all these years, as you mentioned, um, I started my activism when I was 18 years old, young university student, uh, while I was one of the organizers for the uh, December 12, 1985, uh, protest the Uyghur and the Kazakh and the other uh, um, students protest in Urumqi. Um, all these years, you know, I have been uh, being an activist, but I had my own professional life. I graduated from university. I came to the United States, as you mentioned earlier, in 1989. And uh, I came as a visiting scholar. Then I became a graduate student. And my major was biology, actually. In graduate school, I studied plant pathology. And I was supposed to be a scientist, uh, but then um, I uh, uh, quit my job and became um, a reporter at Radio Free Asia, I tried to be the voice for my voiceless people. And then um, I was in the international business world. Um, I was a, a business development director for international business, for corporates. So all these times, you know, I had my personal life and I have three kids. Now I have five actually between me and my husband. We have five children and the, uh, I had life. I used to vacation. I used to enjoy myself. I used to read. Um, I used to do fun things for myself. I had hobbies, but since my sister's abduction, I have been working seven days a week um, with Campaign for Uyghurs, with the wonderful, wonderful uh, people we have uh, on our board from all over the world, and uh, with the uh, you know full-time staff we have. Um, we are trying to um, fight against the uh, Chinese regime's false uh, narratives and fal false propagandas, and also try to um, empower Uyghur women and youth and they lead them to activism uh, while we are doing uh, raising awareness work ourselves. 
Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I've been following your work for quite some time now, and I'm really honored that you gave us this time. I'd love to have you back sometime in the future. I know you're super, super busy. Is there any last message you'd like to give to all the students from across the world who are going to be watching this? Because um, we we want to be people of action, right? We, we don't just want to do activism alone. We also want to do lobbying. We also want to write to MPs and do these things. So in terms of campaign for Uyghurs, how can students get involved in your organization? Yes, uh, we are actually establishing a uh, like chapter student uh, chapter groups, like university chapters. So uh, please contact us uh, at contact at campaignforweavers.org. And you can also uh, reach us uh, through our uh, website, uh, www.campaignforweavers.org. Um, and the, uh, at the bottom, there is contact information with our emails. Um, I just want to say a few things um, about the CCP and the universities, um, especially, you know, it's so vital, so important for the uh, university students to get involved, um, to stop this atrocity, because um, it's not just the, the, uh, the Uyghur's future is at stake. It's not just the one religion or, uh, you know, it's the entire world's future is at stake with what the Chinese government is doing. Freedom and the democracy is at stake. Um, so you don't have to be Uyghur or you don't have to be an activist to get involved. All you have to be is a, a human with a conscience. So one enormous issue is um, you know, how the uh, Chinese Communist Party has infiltrated our academic institutions, our universities, uh, which should be places where free speech and academic discourse are welcome. But, um, you know, uh, the children of the Chinese officials uh, responsible for this genocide are studying at the foreign universities while Uyghurs have their passports seized and thrown into concentration camps for studying abroad. You know, if they have ever studied abroad, they are sent to concentration camps. So how can this be permitted in the uh, in the West um, that the Chinese regime is uh, brainwashing our universities and the uh, manipulating our professors? Um, myself, actually, I just want to give you a, a, a one uh, example of what happened at Columbia University. Uh, we were scheduled to have a panel. Uh, this was about a year and a half ago, the fall of uh, 2019. And with uh, myself and the Tibetan and the uh, a Taiwanese activist and the uh, Hong Kong activist and the, uh, someone from uh, Tiananmen Square uh, Democratic Movement. But uh, the Columbia University canceled our panel because Chinese students there protested against it. Can you imagine, you know, something like this is supposed to happen in China, but a university in America so additionally, you know, we see through cases like uh, that uh, of the university student uh, Drew Polo in Australia. You probably know him. He's very active uh, in social media. Uh, how his choice to speak out on the Chinese regime's human rights atrocities resulted in his expulsion because of how the universities have become dependent on the Chinese money. So this is an enormous problem. The CCP is also continuing to operate the Confucius Institutes at the universities, now often called the language centers or cultural centers, under the guise of cultural exchange. Uh, but the, these are, in fact, funded by the Chinese Communist Party itself. And the SS, uh, you know, such can present the whitewashed views of the uh, history and the uh, the uh, Chinese Communist Party. So this is absolutely unacceptable. And the, we should all be working together to see that these are shut down. The students should get involved to establish the real uh, democracy and the freedom that uh, they can exercise. Um, so one recent victory was, you know, was a long, Fought was Tufts University. Uh, the students there 
uh, approach to university and they just recently uh, closed uh, their uh, remaining Confucius Institute. So how students can get involved, you know, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Campaign for Uyghurs uh, has the uh, campus chapter groups to amplify advocacy efforts and the uh, empower students to take the uh, messaging on stopping the Uyghur genocide uh, to their uh, you know, campuses to work with us on that. So please contact us. And we also encourage students to ensure uh, that the Confucius institutes uh, are not operating on their campuses. So they need to be really uh, active on that. And they also, the students can write uh, for their, you know, university papers, like, uh, you know, like uh, student papers or organize virtual panels, rallies, and the awareness events. And that's one way of, uh, you know, getting involved. That's how I started my activism when I was 18 years old uh, to organizing a uh, protest. So you can also, um, as a student, you know, the university students can uh, uh, try to end the sponsorship from the companies who are profiting off of the Uyghur uh, forced labor. Uh, China is uh, Chinese communist regime is making Uyghurs uh, as slaves, and the, uh, you can uh, ask your university uh, closely examine uh, study abroad programs to ensure that the freedom of speech of uh, participating students will be protected and to uh, consider moving programs to a uh, democratic uh, countries uh, like Taiwan if they want to study Chinese, you know. So um, it, it uh, really disturbingly, you know, it hurts me to see how the Chinese government is not only getting away with this genocide, but uh, they are getting rewarded by uh, hosting the uh, Beijing uh, 2022 yeah. Olympics. So that's uh, one other thing that students can get involved, uh, writing to the uh, International Olympic Committee and they try to uh, ask your uh, lawmakers, politicians, your government to, uh, you know, boycott basically the, uh, the Olympic Games. This is genocidal games um, when uh, uh, the Uyghur organizations such as World Uyghur Congress and the other, you know, uh, our organization and the others contacted the uh, OIC. Uh, the OIC says it cannot be political. Therefore, they are going to ignore. Can you imagine this, you know? So uh, we should ask, are these the crimes against humanity the Chinese government is doing are political? Or do they pierce whatever remnant of the conscience left when women are forced to marry men they don't love for fear of being called extremists for refusing? Is it political? Is mass rape it's a political problem? Living in an Orwellian hell of surveillance is that political? Forced abortions, the women cannot even have the right for your own body, forced sterilization, forced abortions, are they political? So what the OIC is saying is basically the, the uh, uh, International Olympic Committee, I'm sorry, the IOC is saying is they are just going to um, take China's uh, manipulations and the money and yeah. they, they are not going to act by conscience. History is repeating itself when you look at it, you know, Nazi Germany while conducting genocide, the Berlin hosted the 1936 yeah. Olympics. Yeah. And Hitler announced the opening of the games to show off the Nazi army, Nazi's power. So is Xi Jinping going to announce the opening of the Olympic Games next year while conducting genocide and try to show off the prestige of the Chinese Communist Party, the Chinese totalitarian regime, are we going to allow that? So every student should think about this and act bravely. Absolutely, a wonderful message to end upon and a hopeful message because we can make the change. I mean, the work that you've done since the 1980s 
is obviously a reason why the Chinese government is targeting you, targeting your family, uh, you know, your uh, your uh, your husband's side of the family. I believe there's a number of people missing, including uh, people who are young, uh, 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 girls, his nieces. So, you know, you're paying a price for opening uh, up this issue and the activism. But everybody who's watching online, I just want to highlight something to you. Um, Sister Roshan, when she speaks up, she loses family members, right? None of us that happens to us. So what what's stopping us? What's stopping us from standing up and 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 basically saying never again? 1941, 2021 is still happening again. Thank you so much, Sister Roshan. May Allah bless you and the work that you do. Campaignforweigers.org. Please get involved and support them. Ramadan's coming up, so I would recommend everybody if you have if you want to donate. Donate to that organization as well. And it's extremely important that we all understand if we don't act now, then our grandchildren will ask us, there used to be these people called the Uyghurs. What did you do when they were being killed? Because I read in the history books, they don't exist anymore. Do you want your grandchildren to ask you that? Well, obviously we don't. So we need to work for this. May Allah bless you, Sister Roshan. Jazakallah khair. And for everybody watching, Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much, brother. Assalamu alaikum.